Hey, Rev students, how you guys doing? Hey, it is good to be back in here with you in Canton. It's, it's been quite a while, so uh, man, I am excited about being with, here with you guys today about uh, continuing in our habit series. How have you guys been enjoying this so far? Mix, mixed reviews, it's okay, we'll get there, we'll get there. Uh, hey, listen, another thing I'm excited about, and I'm not sure if you are a lot like me, um, and I love sharing my favorite things with people. I'm not sure if you're like that. Uh, if you know me, you know this is true. I'm also the most like persistent person you've ever met, so like, if I like a movie and you haven't seen it, I'm going to bother you till you watch this movie that I, I love and hold dear uh, to me. With, without any uh, forgiveness or our lack of persistence, I will, I will uh, haunt you until you want, watch the movie. And if you have any doubts about that, you can just ask Cecily, because uh, she has still not watched the movie that I've asked her to watch. And so now I'm publicly declaring that to everyone in this moment uh, that she needs to watch that movie. But man, I, are any of you like that? Does anyone, have anyone experienced that? Like I'm like that about food. Does anyone like that about food? So like I have one of my favorite burgers. I'm not sure if you have like a favorite burger or a favorite food. One of my favorite burgers is the Burger Fi burger. Has anyone ever been to Burger Fi? Right, so BurgerFi is great. They, they stamp their logo into the bun, like that's just cool. Like more people should do that. Uh, but uh, man, I love it, and specifically the Bad Burger. Does anyone know what the Bad Burger is? It's the breakfast all day burger. It's their, their normal burger with like a hash brown and then an egg and then bacon and syrup. And I, I promise you, uh, it is glorious and it is great, and if you have not tried it, you should, but, but man, I, I, I want you to try it. Like, I'm excited about it right now, talking about this burger, because I want you uh, to try it. And I, I'm the same way about movies. Like I said, one of my uh, favorite movies I love to show people is the movie The Visit. I'm not sure if anyone has seen The Visit. Uh, it's, uh, it's a movie about students like yourself, uh, a pair of siblings, and uh, they have never met their grandparents before, and so uh, they go on a trip to meet their grandparents for the first time and hang out, and it just gets weird. Their grandparents start doing a lot of creepy stuff, like clawing at their door at night, and uh, there's this one scene where their grandmother's like chasing them uh, uh, under the house, and uh, so, but you know, it's, it's, they were playing tag. It's all good, so uh, but I, I love sharing people that movie. And, and, and listen to me, if that is your experience with your grandparents, let your small group leader know. We can help you. Um, but but I, I love it. It's, it's an M. Night Shyamalan movie, so that means there's like all these plot twists. And like I said, I'm excited talking about it right now because I love sharing my favorite things with people. And, and, so, and this, this is a universal truth. I'm, I'm not sure if you've ever heard this before. Uh, if you love something, you talk about it. If, if you love something, you talk about it. Because uh, like I said, if you, what gets you excited, what you love, what, you, what, what you know, uh, influences you, you want other people to experience the same thing that you have. And if this is true, and like I said, I believe this is a universal truth. If this is true, why is it so hard for those of us who say we love Jesus to talk about him? What, what makes it so hard for those of us who say, uh, Jesus is, is, is Lord in my life and I love him and he has died and he saved me, yet it's so far, hard for us to talk about him like we talk about our favorite burger or our favorite uh, movie. One of my uh, favorite pastors, teachers, authors, his name is John Piper. Uh, his kind of quote, claim to fame, one of his sayings is, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied him. And this is that same idea. I don't want you to miss this. If we're talking about the burger, the burger is made much of, the burger is lifted up as I am sharing about how excited I am, as I talk about how crispy the bacon is and how sweet the syrup is, as I share about it, as I share about my experience with it, that burger seems great. Uh, same thing about the movie, and in the same way, as we experience God, as we share about what God has done in our lives, as we share about uh, what God is doing and all that he has done since the beginning of time, God is lifted up, God is made much of because what we love, we talk about. What we love, we talk about. And when we do that, just like as I've talked about this burger for the fourth time now, all of you, if you have not yet been like salivating at the thought of this burger, in the same way as we share about God, as we share about our experiences and what he's done, other people will see that and they will want to experience the same thing. 
And, and not only does it, it benefit other people as well, but, but sharing about God benefits us. When, when, when we share about God, when we talk about him, it actually helps us get to know him better. Talking about God helps us know him better. And you may have never thought about that before, but as you talk about something, as you are experiencing something, as you are sharing it with other people, uh, usually your, your knowledge about the, the topic grows, right? Like for me to share about that burger to you, I had to get really detailed about all the toppings and, and all that is going on with it. And in the same way, as our relationship with God grows, as we begin to share about God, as we do all of those things, you know, we've talked the last couple of weeks about talking with God and listening to him. As we do those things, our relationship grows and our knowledge with him grows as well. And so what I wanna spend our time uh, today talking about is, is some hows and some whys of sharing the gospel. Because like I said, if we truly love something, we will wanna talk about it. And for some reason, it's so hard when it comes to sharing about how much we love Jesus, what he has done for us. And so I wanna spend a, some time talking about that. We're gonna start off in first uh, Peter, and Peter is, is here, he's writing to people who are being persecuted and suffering for sharing the gospel. And in 1 Peter 3, he says, but in your hearts, honor Christ as the Lord, as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and with respect. And so uh, something I want to point out here starting off is he says, always be prepared to make a defense. And uh, for some reason in our mentality, in our culture, we almost feel like it's the opposite. If we are gonna share something with someone, if we are gonna tell someone about Jesus, it almost feels like we have to attack, right? We have to attack whatever uh, they believe in. We have to attack their behaviors. We have to attack all these things uh, to tell them about Jesus. And, and Peter here, he's saying, hey, no, it doesn't look like that. He says, you need to prepare a defense and you need to do it with gentleness and respect. Would, would you say a lot of the conversations, maybe you've seen videos online or, or seen it portrayed in a movie, and a lot of times it doesn't look like it's done with gentleness and respect. And, and he, he says here uh, the, the motivation, right? He says the motivation is not to start an argument. The motivation is not to uh, judge anyone. It's, it's not that people would look at you and see you as great. But he says hey, the motivation, what, what you need to be prepared is to share the hope that you have in. Share the hope that you have in. You might have never uh, thought about it before, but we put our hope in a lot of things. If you are about to get on an airplane, you are putting a tremendous amount of hope that that plane is going to take off and that it is going to land in the places that you want it to. Uh, we, we put our hope in everything that we do. There is a, a level of hope. And so we say, hey, you need to be prepared to respond on why you're putting your hope in Jesus. What are the reasons? What are the evidences that you're putting your hope in Jesus and it goes back to your story. There has been a point in your life where God has done something, where you have been in a situation, and I don't know what it is, whether it was something with your family, whether it was something with a friend, whether it was something uh, on, your, on your team. You have been in a situation where you realized you were lacking and you were in need. Man, you realize that you, in whatever that you were facing, whatever was going on, you realize you were helpless in that situation to solve it. And in that moment, you are realizing you need someone bigger than you are, you need someone stronger than you are. You need someone uh, who is completely different than you to solve this problem. And it is in those moments that we cry out to God. Not only does he come and rescue us and save us, but he tells us that he loves us. And, and, and this is the, the thought process that's all throughout scripture as it's uh, pertaining to this subject. The apostle Paul uh, talks about it in Romans chapter 10, right? Uh, he begins Romans chapter 10 saying, hey, my, my prayer, my desire is that the people that I know, the people that I care about, the people that I love, that they would be saved. And I think if we did an evaluation around the room, we would all say that that's true. Hey, I want the people that I care about. I want the people in my family. I want my, my friends. I want them to know who Jesus is. And so, so if that is our motivation, Paul begins to explain what that looks like in Romans uh, chapter 10, 13, he says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What he is saying here is everyone who gets to that point of neediness, 
everyone who gets to that point of lacking, everyone who gets to that point of realizing they need someone uh, bigger than themselves, that, that those people, when they cry out to God, that God responds in that moment and they can be saved. And so I want to ask you a very simple question and uh, how can someone cry out to a God that they don't know about? How can someone who is in desperate need of help request that from a God that they've never heard about, that they they don't know anything? Paul's gonna continue this thought uh, in verse 14. He says, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him uh, who they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And and students, I want you to hear something today. You may have never thought about this before, but you have been sent. Students, you you have been sent. And you you have been sent. And as you are sent, you, you can preach. And as you preach, people will hear it. And as they hear it, they will believe. And you say, hey, this is how it works. And, and we hear that word preach and we get really confused and we hear that word preach and we're like, hey, Jeremy, isn't that your job? And what he is talking about right there has nothing to do with the stage, has nothing to do with microphones, has nothing to do uh, with people sitting in an auditorium. Uh, that word there means to announce something of importance. And students, when you are sitting at your dinner table, when you are sitting Uh, in the locker room with your your sports team, when you're sitting uh, in the lunchroom, when you are at the bus stop and you say, hey, there is something that is important that I need you to know about, and his name is Jesus. You are preaching, students. And he says, you've been sent. Now, I don't know where you've been sent to. I don't know the, the schedule of your life, but God has placed you where you are. He's placed you in the neighborhood that you live in, He's placed you uh, in the community that you are in and the activities that you are part of for one reason, because you were sent there. And you were sent there to preach, to tell people that there is something so important they have to know about it. And as you do that, they will hear and they can believe. And man, I feel like the reason that this is so hard and I feel like the reason that we don't do this is because we are afraid that we'll fail. We, we are afraid that we are gonna mess this up. And may, maybe you've had thoughts like, hey, I, I don't know enough. What if, how am I supposed to tell someone about who Jesus is and what God's done when I barely understand it myself? Maybe you're afraid of saying something wrong or, or, or something stupid and being made fun of. Maybe you're afraid that if you begin to talk about this, someone might get upset, that it will become confrontational, and you're not trying to upset anyone, you're trying to have this positive conversation, but, but if you say this, if you say the wrong thing, someone is going to get upset, and, and I want to challenge that line of thinking for a moment, this line of thinking that we have to have everything figured out before we tell someone about Jesus. When it comes to your favorite things in your life, your favorite foods, your favorite movies. Do do you know every single ingredient that goes into your food? Do you know the perfect temperature that is is set to to cook at? Can you write down on a piece of paper the instructions to get to the final product? For your favorite movie, do you know the name of every actor in the movie? Do you know the locations that it was shot on? Do you know the script changes that that took place to get it where it ended up? My bet is that the answer to that question is no, yet that does not stop us from talking about the things we love when it comes to our food, when it comes to uh, movies, when it comes to whatever is exciting you. Whatever you love, that doesn't stop you in these other areas, and it it doesn't stop you here. And listen, students, you don't have have to know everything about God to share something with someone. You don't have to know everything about God to share something with someone. And that is why Peter is saying, hey, you have to share the hope that you have in. Because when you share something that's real for you, people begin to see not only your story and your situation as real, but they see what God's done in it as real too. And and I also think the, the other side to the 
this mentality of, hey, what if we fail? What if we, we, we mess this up? Is that the responsibility is on us. That ultimately the dependence of how this conversation go is going to be on us. That if we don't articulate it in the right way, if we don't have enough passion, if we don't communicate the right things in the right moments, that this whole thing is going to get messed up and, and someone is not going to believe. And can I tell you something? That is, that is intimidating and that is a, a burden you were not meant to bear. That is a burden. Uh, I can't bear that burden, even, even as someone who stands up on a stage and, and teaches and, and as I study and as I get into this, ultimately, the dependent factor on someone's receiving the gospel is not on me and it's not on you. And uh, Paul's going to uh, uh, talk about this uh, mentality, this, this idea that the, the dependency is not on us and in 2 Corinthians 4.1, this is what he says, therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. He's saying, hey, you might not know this, but you're in ministry. He says, you have been sent to the, the areas that you live in to preach, to tell them about who Jesus is and what he's done and then he says, don't, don't lose heart. He is acknowledging in this moment that not only is this difficult, not only is this hard, but there are gonna be times when you will want to give up. That it will seem like, hey, this isn't worth it, like this isn't working, I'm not good enough. And it can be overwhelming. Paul, Paul continues. He says, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways we refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is in the image of God. What he is saying here is when it comes to this, this book right here, we don't have to dress it up to make it sound better than it actually is. We don't have to change it so it doesn't upset anyone. He is saying the best news that you can find is already in here that, that the God that created everything, the God that uh, created the stars and the heavens and the earth, the God that gives you the very breath that you breathe, that he wrapped himself in flesh and he came and lived a perfect life that you never could, and he died a death that you deserved so that you could know him. And he's saying, if someone does not accept this, if someone does not believe this, if someone is hesitant or even resistant, he's saying there's a veil. There, there are spiritual forces at play that are, are blocking them from seeing clearly what, what you see. He says, if you see this clearly, you are unveiled. He's saying there are some spiritual forces that are keeping people, maybe people that you care about, maybe people that you love from seeing God as who he is. Man, and so many people focus on this as a negative, like, well, why, why if, if people are veiled, if there's spirit, supernatural forces that are, are stopping what I am trying to do, why should I even try? Man, and... and when I think about it, the opposite is also true, isn't it? That if there's people who are veiled, that means that there are people who are unveiled. People who are literally just waiting for someone to be sent, for someone to preach, so that they can hear, so that they can believe, and that they can cry out, and that God can rescue them, and he can save them. And students, I don't know who is veiled and who isn't. But I know if I talk about him, that people will hear about him. And that if someone who is, is veiled hears about it, they might be resistance. But if, if this person is unveiled, they might begin to see God for who he is and they will cry out and they will be saved. And students, maybe you're talking to someone and you're like, man, this person is really resistant and maybe they're veiled. Can I tell you something? In that moment, you can begin to pray, God, I think this person is veiled. God, take whatever spiritual forces, your supernatural forces are greater than anyone else's supernatural forces. 
because God is in the business of saving people, students. I don't know who it is in your life. I don't know who it is who is lost, who is hurting, who is broken, and who doesn't know that Jesus is the answer to all those things. But, but what I do know is that, that Paul later says that as we tell people about who Jesus is and what he's done for us, that it is the aroma of Christ to those who are being saved. Like, as we talk about Jesus, Jesus begins to smell good to some people, right? Have you ever been in a Mexican restaurant and someone brings out the fajita meal and you're like, man, I'm really wishing that was my food at this moment, it smells so good? It's exactly what he's talking about here. You, you begin to tell someone what God has done in your life. You begin to tell someone how Jesus has changed everything for you. Oh, I need someone who can change everything for me. I need someone who is bigger and stronger and better than my situation. Students, you're, you're being sent. And there are people around you who need to hear how good this God is. And, and, and when, it, when it comes to this issue, students, our responsibility is simply obedience, not results. Our responsibility is obedience not results, that, that when we come in contact, when God puts someone in our path, when God puts someone around us, that we would just simply say, hey, man, this is too important for me not to tell you. And God says, that is your responsibility. I'm gonna handle the rest because I am the one who is bigger, because I am the one who is stronger, because I am the one who is better. Man, and I, I don't know what's going to happen in that conversation with your family. I don't know, know what's going to happen in that conversation with your, your friend or someone on your team. But I know that you've been sent, students. I often think about the people in my life, people in my family, people who, who are my friends, who have been my friends for a really long time, and I'm saying, hey, I, I'm not sure if they know Jesus I mean, I'm, I'm just praying, God, I need you to do something. And, and even as I begin to, to, to engage in conversation, I mean, it seems like they're veiled. It seems like there's something stopping them from seeing what I'm seeing. And I'm just praying, God, I need you to do something. I, I am not big enough. I am not strong enough. I can't articulate anything well enough in this moment to get past this, but you can. And I feel like this was the, the Apostle Paul's uh, heart this, this realization of how helpless we are and how much we need someone bigger and stronger than us. And in Romans chapter nine, he says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears witness to me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off for the sake of Christ for my brothers my kinsmen, according to the flesh. And students, I don't know if you've ever thought seriously about the people that God has put in your life, your friends and your family, and if they know Jesus, and I'm not trying to be cliche, and I'm not trying to uh, put fear in you, but students, if they don't know Jesus, if they, if they die tomorrow, if they died a year from now, and if what the Bible says is true, and I believe it's true that they're gonna spend an eternity in hell, and that every day I wake up after that, they're still there, and every day I wake up after that, and they're still there, and every day I wake up after that, and they're still there. Man, I don't want that. I care too much. It is too important. And Paul here is overwhelmed. He's, he's even saying like there's very few times in the Bible where it says, hey, I'm not lying. Like it needs some qualifying statement. He's saying, I wish I could trade all that you've given me and just give it to everyone else because that's how much my heart is broken. And maybe you're not there. And if I'm being honest, I, I'm not there either. But my question to you is, do you care enough to have a conversation? Do you care enough about the people that God has put around you to have a conversation? 
Students, if we truly care about the people that God has put around us, we will want them to know God better. We will want them to know that he's real. We want them to know that he is better, that he is great, that he is lifted up. Man, and I'm praying, I'm thinking of those people, and I'm just like, if God, if, if, if just do something, just do something, I need them to know that you're real, that you're the only hope that we have. I need them to see what I see. And students, I, if your heart isn't broken for the people that God has put in your life, if you don't seriously consider the fact that there are people right now that you love and care about that have a possibility to spend eternity in hell, man, I'm, I'm gonna, students, you need to get on your hands and knees and pray for God to change your heart. His heart is broken. His heart is so broken over lost people that he sent his only son to die on a cross so that that wasn't the only option. Student, how's your heart? Who around you needs to know him? I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a, a quick uh, just example of how you can share with someone, something really simple. Th three, three phrases, I was, but God, and now. Man, I was lost, I was confused, I was scared, I was hurt, I was, fill in the blank. But God came in and he rescued me and he, he saved me and he supernaturally changed my situation. But God, and now my life is completely different. And now my family is completely different. And now my world is completely different and the people around me are completely different. And maybe you're thinking you have to know all of these things and you have to have all this information but God's just asking you to have a conversation. Students, and listen, you don't have to know everything or everyone to share something with someone. And when we do that, not only do others get to know God, but we get to know him better. Pray with me. God, we come to you today, Lord. God, we are, are thankful. God, that you, you would even care enough to, to bring us, to gather us in this place here to tell us about who you are and what you've done. God, and that we would realize our helplessness when it comes to the people around us, that we don't have enough fancy words and uh, theological truths to, to convince anyone of anything, but we need supernatural power from you to remove veils and change people's hearts. And I, I wanna Pray for one moment. If you are in this room and you would say, when I walked into this room, there is a veil, but I am seeing differently. I am hearing things differently. God, God is completely different to me in this moment and I am crying out. I mean, I, I've heard. And I believe and I'm crying out that there's a God that cares enough about me that he would rescue me from my situation, that he would save me, that he loves me, that he would move in my life. And if that's true, that changes everything. And so if that is you in the room, I want you to pray with me real quick. God, I need you. I don't have all the answers. I don't know all the things. But if you are there and you sent your son to die for me and you're inviting me into your family and you care enough about me to move into my situation, God, I want to know you better. I wanna grow in a relationship with you. I want to follow you. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if that's you in the room today, I want you to do things, two things for me. The first thing is I just want you to raise your hand. We actually have people uh, in the room to, to, to give you something, a gift from us to help you uh, begin this new life that you've started. And, and the second thing I want you to do is I want you to tell your small group leader. I want you to go to your small group leader when small groups start and say, everything's changed. I was, but God, 
and now. God, for the rest of us, I, I ask that you break our hearts for the people you've put around us to give us hope that you can move in any situation, God, and that you help us be bold in telling people all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.